Good evening, everyone. And again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We know it's after hours, uh, but we did have a pretty good uh, incentive for y'all to be able to join us this evening as we discuss white for workflow and red for rules in conjunction with the new Kent Winery located here in our home state of Virginia. I'm gonna go through some quick slides to discuss who we are as a business and as a platform. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our sommelier, Jake Dombrowski, who's also on the call. Um, he'll discuss our white wine, give us some tasting notes, and then we'll continue on into a workflow demo. And then later we'll do the same for the red wine. If you've got questions at any time, we really welcome those especially uh, you know, before we get to drinking. So you can use the question and answers button at the top of your Zoom panel uh, or feel free to chat with us and we'd be happy to, uh, to respond to your questions there. So at Decisions Core, we are a platform that enables business users to be able to automate and optimize critical business processes without using code. Tonight's webinar is going to be all about healthcare, but we do function in a number of other verticals like financial services and insurance, government, manufacturing, and higher education. But our real presence is within healthcare because of the strength of our rules engine. I want to highlight some of our customers in the healthcare vertical now and also discuss some of the automation patterns that we see these customers use in the wild when they implement decisions at their organization. At one end of the spectrum, you've got customers who may use the rules engine more than the workflow engine. Uh, but as you'll learn as we go through this presentation, really it's a continuum. It's, it's a spectrum of the different designers that you may use and touch within the decisions platform. And here at the business rules side of things, we've got organizations like New York City, as well as the National Cancer Institute that are using our graphical rules editors to allow clinicians, social workers to be able to enter in rules that then go on to control um, services that are provided. For instance, the National Cancer Institute is using us to drive inclusion and exclusion criteria for breast cancer studies. As you start to move closer to the workflow engine, you can get into things like batch processing, uh, many of you probably recognize the brand Philips. They're a huge manufacturer of MRI and CT machines, and they've got different contracts negotiated with every clinic and hospital where they lease these giant machines. And every night from around the world, they send this data to a decision server. They massage the data, cleanse it, run it through rules and calculations to be able to figure out what does each one of those customers owe for the day. We know that a tool like Decisions would never be an island at your organization. We're coming into probably a well-populated ecosystem. And to that end, our founders really made Decisions accessible with a very open API layer. So we can extend and expand on apps that you already have in place. Maybe they're applications that do 80% of what you need, but you need just a tweak to really get that 20% more power. You can think of decisions as a add-on component, like a brain for Microsoft Dynamics, uh, SAP, Salesforce, and other ERP and, and CRM systems. Along with that, extending and expanding on existing applications, we can also serve as a system integrator and control workflow and orchestrate workflow that crosses application boundaries and may pass from human hands to machines and back, all while maintaining an audit trail. Lastly, we've got pure user workflow uh, where you're able to create forms, capture documents, send things for signature, for approvals or rejection. Um, and for instance, one of our customers, Clinical Solutions Pharmacy, uh, they're doing this for pharmacy orders uh, from the different clients that they serve. At the end of the day, though, Decisions really bridges that gap between 
your IT team, your development team, and your business users, the people who know the process, so you can deliver better software faster. Just to give you an idea, we have one customer on the West Coast, uh, NG Impact. They went from an eight-week development cycle to a two-day dev cycle by putting both trained business users on decisions and their dev team in the same room. Uh, by eliminating the need for the dev team to create rules and workflow, the business users could focus on that while the dev team built out the integrations. It, it was a pretty um, awesome story. Um, and we've got actually a couple of resources of that on our website. So um, if you'd like more information, uh, do feel free to, to check it out there. In terms of our architecture, we are delivered through the web browser. So any modern web browser, you'll be able to access decisions. We also have a mobile app and everything can be accessed via API. Every rule, every rule set and every flow. We require a SQL server to install, but generally that's just to store the business rules or the flow logic. You can rely on any external system of record that you're currently using uh, and where that data lives. And to that end, we can be HIPAA compliant because you can deploy us on-prem and you can rely on that external system of record. So none of the data has to live within Decision SQL Server. It's a really easy way to comply, not only with HIPAA, but different parts of, of the CFR. For instance, if you're a manufacturer of medical devices or drugs, in our deployment model, we can be both cloud uh, or on-prem. We can be an Azure, AWS, Google Cloud platform. And then our licensing is pretty different from most anybody else in, the, in, the, uh, in our space. We license by the server. So it's unlimited rules, unlimited workflow, unlimited users, unlimited transactions. Uh, you have one budget line item every year and you can automate as much as you'd like. Um, I call this colloquially our all you can automate model. Now, Tim is going to get into some of these tools later on, so I'm not going to spend too much time showing them. But with Decisions Graphical Designers, you're able to build every part of an application layer from your data layer to the business logic and rules layer up through your workflow and any humans that might need to be involved in a process all the way to the components that you expose for end users to see like forms, dashboards, reports, task lists, uh, key performance indicator tiles, etc. We come with a long list of external integrations. Uh, we also support single sign-on and pretty much can connect to any major database vendor. We also can expose uh, these different web uh, items that you build through various web service. We typically rely on REST, but we can also use uh, SOAP, XML, JSON, and others. Lastly, no code does not mean lightweight. We also offer an SDK if you need to extend our product, but so few customers rely on this. Um, I would say probably less than than 5%. Um, we have around 6,000 different workflow steps and then thousands of options for rules. So we're gonna get to the good part now. I'm gonna turn it over to Jake from New Kent Winery and he's gonna take, uh, take us through this uh, tasting for the white wine. And then we'll have our workflow demonstration with Tim af shortly afterwards. Uh, then we'll go on into the red tasting and then we'll have our rules demonstration. Um, and then finally, we'll end with the q and I'll remind everybody, you can type in your questions at any time um, and we'll, we'll touch them at the end. Uh, it's better to type them when they pop into your head uh, so you don't forget them and you know maybe the, the wine won't let you forget them. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jake. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate being here with you guys today. Um, it's been a, a pleasure working with the decisions team um, as they've uh, navigated this and also uh, taught me a little bit about their processes and procedures. So first I'd like first off, I'd like to say we're going to start with our white wine. Um, I hope everyone has received those wines. Um, if you haven't chilled your white wine, that's perfectly fine for the tasting portion of this. But I would recommend putting the cork back in and getting it chilled if you're going to enjoy it after the uh, after the webinar tonight. So 
I'd like to start off with our, our, our 2019 uh, Chardonnay. This is 100% stainless steel aged Chardonnay. Um, this is all grown in the state of Virginia here. It's all estate grown. So these wines, um, every wine that you'll try tonight is grown here in the state of Virginia. Um, I know that not everyone maybe have their bottle open yet, so I'll go a little bit slower when it comes to this first wine. Um, but our Chardonnay, we, we, we forced this into a stainless steel, si stainless steel si style um, to kind of avoid a little bit of the uh, heavier buttery tannins. Um, you're going to get a nice kind of floral, um, a really tropical nose. Um, being close to the Virginia Beach region and the coast of Virginia, we see a lot of customers who like that um, beach style. Um, so a little bit of a lighter wine. Uh, it's meant to be enjoyed with a little bit of crisp flavor. Um, pairs very well with seafoods as well. So feel free to go ahead and um, go ahead and take a sip of that wine. So I'm joining in as well. So you'll taste a little bit more of those pineapple flavors on this wine, uh, a little more of those um, tropical flavors. I call them like a citrus, a lemon, a lime, um, really the important thing. And please, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A. That always helps me out in these, uh, these sessions. And it's become more, I've become more accustomed to these over the course of the past year or so. So in Virginia, we have a, a relatively large wine growing region in the state of Virginia. So you have your wines that come from the western part of the state, which I like to call the mountains here in Virginia, all the way to where I am on the coastal plains. Um, and everyone grows relatively the same varieties of grapes, but we all grow a different style and make a different style of wine. So it really adds to the ambiance of the wines. Um, I like to say in Virginia, you can you can try wines from all different regions that are the same wine and they will be completely different. And I, I only speak a lot about Virginia because most of our customers for this webinar, I know, are out, outside of the state other than just the decisions team. So it's it's nice to see that others are interested not only in the decisions product, but also in a product from the state of Virginia. So I'll talk a little bit about Chardonnay on the East Coast compared to the West Coast. Um, on the East Coast, you're gonna see a little bit more of this crisp, this clean flavor, uh, more of that sweetness, a little bit shorter growing season, so a little bit more sugar, a little more acid within the wines. On the West Coast, they have a longer growing season. They're able to grab more of those marbleized flavors within the actual grape. Then they normally do a barrel aging process and that's gonna give you your oaky and buttery tannins to the wine. And it looks like we don't have any questions as of this point. So I'll, I'll pull a couple more things out of my hat. Um, so a little bit about the white wine varietals that are grown in the state of Virginia. Now we typically grow more of our viniferas. So your Chardonnays, your Pinot Grigios, um, we grow actually some Pinot Noir here in Virginia. Um, we grow a lot of hybrids too. So we do see some more hybrid grapes that come from the northern region of the, the northeast. So we see a little more of our Vidal Blancs, our Traminettes, more of our hybrid varieties, a little more cold hardy and can withstand the humid temperatures and also the, the winter. All right, so I think for that, I think now I'm ready to turn it over to Bracey as we go into the next portion of the webinar. Thanks, Jake. 
And I, in turn, am going to put us in the very capable hands of Tim, our sales engineer, uh, for our healthcare workflow demonstration. Great. Thank you, Bracey. And, and I, I also, I do want to say the wine is absolutely delicious. As, as a someone who, who lives in the state of Georgia and has not tried Virginia wine before, um, I must say that that Chardonnay is absolutely crisp and clear and was just, just fantastic. So I, I thank you so much for, for sharing that with us and, and explaining about, you know, how you, how you grow and what, what is uh, actually available within Virginia. <clears throat> So that being said, um, as Brace mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in here. And what we see in front of us right now is the back end of the decisions platform. So this is where you would, you know, folks would go to either build, you know, to build those particular elements, those, those workflows, those rules, uh, the various types of integrations, and even dashboards. So this is where the users would go to actually build that. And what we see in front of us today and what we're going to look through is a demonstration of a workflow that we designed around a, a fictitious company that is working in the healthcare industry. This company has, has patients and they have multiple facilities across the country that these patients have to move between. As we said, this is kind of fictitious, so go ahead and just stay with me. Um, but the idea here is that using the power of the workflow engine with some of the rules back behind it, we're able to have a user go in, submit a request to have one of these patients moved. During that request process, they'll input some information about who the patients are, where they're at, and most importantly, what type of medications that they are on. And during this process, the, the pharmacists at the, at the facilities that the patients are being sent to have the ability to look over the order that's being sent over and go through it and verify that the informations regarding the medications are correct. And you even have the ability to swap them out based on certain aspects of the medication, such as cost saving, or maybe that facility doesn't carry that particular type of medication and has another one that would work just fine. Through that process, then it goes off to the facility who's able to do a, a check on it, verify that everything's correct, and verify that they have all of those, those medications in stock, send it back to the pharmacist who signs off on it, and then the patient is transferred. So looking at this today, what we have in front of us is a dashboard that was built in our page designer. So again, everything about decisions and what sets us apart from the, the competition is that we are a 100% no-code platform. And all of these elements you see in front of us from these, these KPI tiles here to this report down here, and even this activity panel or audit trail are all things that are done visually through drag and drop designers. There is absolutely no code behind this that a user has to create to build what you're going to see today. So to kick this process off, what we're going to do is actually, I'm going to expand my little panel over here where I can see all of the different elements within my system. And I'm going to come up here to my workflow catalog and go ahead and submit a new request. And when I click on that, that's what's actually going to start the process. That's going to kick off that workflow and it's going to start by showing us a form. So I'm going to go ahead and click on submit new request and you'll see a form that pops up in front of us here. Now, again, this was built in one of our drag and drop designers. So we can see this, this form here with all of the various elements on it that the user has to fill out to actually uh, submit this request. You can see we've pre-populated our date. We need to go ahead and give this a, a prescriber and a facility name. And uh, since this one is next to me, I'm going to use this as my facility. And we'll get our patient's name and information. Of course, a very fictitious name there. You can tell by me completely making up my own name in the boxes there. And while I'm typing this in by hand, there are also, of course, you know, different designers and, and ways to pick this address. So again, it's all visual. It's nothing you have to type in. Now, in the case of this prescribed medication box here, what we have is there is a database on the back end of this. And when a user submits the particular medication, we're doing a lookup and we're seeing, you know, does that facility have that? And if not, are there alternative medications that they could use that are available at that location? So when I type that in or paste that in, as I move to my other field, you'll see this middle section has been populated with those particular possible uh, medications that could be used. I'll go ahead and fill out a couple of custom fields here. And now what we have the ability to do is select what's our justification. 
So what is our reason behind the change that we might make down here with these other medications? We can select that and see we have all sorts of different options available. And the one we'll use today is actually cost savings. I'll go ahead and select that. And now again, we have these different alternative our alternative medications down here that could be used. If I wanted to say, you know, remove this one, for instance, because we don't need it, I could simply click on remove. And then under our directions here, in our case, we'll go ahead and use the same directions uh, for the, these particular medications as well. And we even have uh, the ability to add notes to this, which will keep up with the workflow along the process. So I could say uh, this, you know, patient requires this medication, for example. And when I hit send, that is going to kick it off into a various number of tasks that then these other users will have to approve or deny. Now, for purposes of this demo, I'm not going to log in and log out 400 times as we go through this. We're just going to pretend we're the, we're, we are all of these people within this company. So I'll go ahead and click send, and we get a notice saying that everything has been submitted for review. And you may have noticed I had a pop-up over there, and that was just letting us know, hey, you had something that was assigned to you. Now, the next person in this process, once this has been uh, submitted, is our pharmacist. So I'm going to go ahead and select their dashboard. So now this one has some other information on it. We still have our key performance indicators, but you'll notice there's some different information in here. So we can do all sorts of logic around the different processes and the data we have in the system and display it in different ways. So we can take the average time from start to end, calculate that out and show that to that user dynamically in, in a way that makes sense for them. Of course, we have charts built into the system. And again, we have our, our activity panel over here that shows us where things are in process and the various different stages they've gone through. One of the great things about the reports in the system is they are all actionable. So what I can do is based on the user I am and the permissions I have, and of course the state that the workflow is in, I can simply come over here and right click on this, this report item and get these actions that are custom to this specific process. So in our case, I'm gonna go ahead and review this request and it's gonna bring up another form. Now it has all that information that I filled out at the other location. So that way the user doesn't have to type anything in. This pharmacist can simply review what's in here and say, you know what, that looks good. Let's go ahead and send it off to the facility. Now, again, you do have other options here as well. So if we needed to push it back, you could do that or they could simply close it. Maybe they clicked on it by accident. We'll go ahead and send it to the facility. We get our another notice that's been sent and we move on to our third dashboard. When I come over here, we'll notice that we have a, an assignment in here in the facility dashboard, and this is where they actually need to take action on this. They'll have to look at this, review it, and then approve or deny this transfer request. Again, they can see all of the different actions that have happened, the comments that have been associated with it, and even who completed that last action. I'll go ahead and come in here, right click again. So you can, you can kind of get a feel for how things work. We have the ability to assign tasks. All the reports are actionable. You can right click on it to get what you need and move through. I'll go ahead and review the transaction. And we have that data presented in a different way where we can see what we need as far as how to approve this. But we can also come down here and we have the ability now to approve or deny this request. If I come into my disposition, we'll go ahead and say that we've it's been approved. We could say that was verbal. Who was the uh, authorizing prescriber? I'm just going to say Steve in this case. And then we have a signature panel that they can actually sign. So now I'll go ahead and approve that. And that is moving back through the process. So now that it's come through our facilities, we actually get to go back to the beginning here. And this, this uh, transaction should be sitting here waiting on us to finalize. So if we come back through here again, we have that last transaction. We can come in here, we can see all of the information, about. we can see who actually signed off on it, and all of that data is automatically kept, tracked, and available for reporting. We'll go ahead and say that we've input it, we put it in our other system, we'll complete the transaction, and now the, there's actually one last thing that has to be done, and that's the pharmacist's final review. So they get this, this request, they have to look at it one last time and say that everything has been taken care of. We've got this information. We agree to it. It's been put into our system. The request is approved and ready to go. I've reviewed it and I'm done. I'll click confirm. The process has been completed. And now back on our main dashboard, we have, if you notice these tabs at the top, I've been clicking through them without explaining them, but I can even go back in and see my approved transactions here. 
I could see my completed ones and we could even see the one that I just did right here for Tim and how, you know, how it progressed through the workflow, who touched it, when did they touch it, how long did they even have the form open, all of that data is stored automatically and can be reported on. So if you have things like SLAs between your, your different departments, or if you want to find a bottleneck, you have a real easy way to go in and report on that. Now, briefly, I will dive into the back end and just show you a, a very high level view of what this looks like in the designer itself. If we're to pop down into our entities here and into our flows, you'll see all the little pieces that created this particular workflow. And I'm going to come down into my main flow here. Now, what's great about our workflow engine, and that's what we're looking at here, this is our workflow designer, is it is completely self-documenting. So as you're looking through this process, someone could come in behind you and immediately know what happened. Well, we showed the user a form. We created that request. We did some mapping. And finally, we came into this review process logic. So you can see we have the ability to embed. In this case, this step is actually another workflow. So just like you see here, we have the ability to embed our workflows within workflows. So you can really make it simple for a user to come in and understand what's going on. If I come into this, we could take a look, and this has the logic behind that request. All the different forms that were used, all the parts where we set states, we sent emails. And you can see there's even some uh, circular logic here. So if we pushed that request back, it could go into that form, and then it just goes around until they actually request it and move it through the process. And for each step here, whether they ignore it, deny it, or approve it, we can use different logic and different paths to actually drive this particular process. So that being said, that is, that is what I have to show for the uh, workflow webinar. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn things back over for our next part of the demonstration. Thank you so much, Tim. And I will remind everyone, um, Please, if you have questions at any time, either in regards to the wine or what's going on in decisions, please pop that in the Q&A feature or in chat, and we'd be happy to answer it. Uh, now we've moved on and we've progressed to the red section of our presentation tonight. So once again, we will have our Somali Jake uh, discuss our Virginia heritage uh, fine red wine. Well, thank you so much again. That was uh, to me in the wine industry. That's that's enlightening that things can be that's that streamlined. Um, we on the agriculture side and on the uh, on the winemaking side, we we tend to not be as uh, as organized as that. But it's good to know that people can get their prescriptions like they need. So um, we are going to jump into our Meritage. So our Meritage is our Bordeaux style blend. Uh, we grow again all these grapes in the state of Virginia here. Um, a large majority of these come from actually New Kent itself, which is where we're based out of, which is about 25 minutes outside of uh, the city of Richmond, and I'd say about 50 minutes to an hour from Virginia Beach and the coast. So um, this wine is actually comprised of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Um, we actually pay the Meritage Society, which is actually based out of France, to utilize the name each year on every single bottle. Um, in the wine industry, uh, Meritages tend to be the most regal wine that a winery can produce. So a nice heavy, a lot of black cherry, a lot of smoke, a lot of oak to these. Um, these wines that we do, our Meritage, typically do 28 to 42 months in barrel. Um, we extend that out depending on demand and need, and we don't actually bring the, the wines out of barrel until we are ready to bottle um, in, or, in order to create more flavors within the wine. So I'd like everybody to go ahead and pour themselves a little bit of this or a lot. It depends on whatever you'd like to do um, and get ready for uh, a short taste of our Meritage. So like I said, you'll taste a, a, a lot of that black cherry, um, a little bit of raspberry as well within the palate. Um, not a very super dry red wine. And the reasoning for this is the terroir of where we actually grow the grapes here in Virginia. So our growing season is 
abnormally short for wine grape growing in this, in the United States. Uh, we typically grow grapes for about about 20 about 20 weeks, where most other country most other regions within the state can grow their grapes. They let me break bud and they grow from little tiny green parts all the way up to um, an actual finished grape product that typically in their time frame is normally 30 to 34 weeks. Um, so we're a little bit behind that. Doesn't sound like a lot, but in, in the in the phenolics of actually growing a grape, it's a big change. Um, so we're a little bit drier on that, not as heavy as a body because of the region that we actually grow in. Um, the cool thing about Meritage, so Meritage is like I said, a Bordeaux style blended wine. Um, the reason that Meritage is as a specific name is there's a Meritage Alliance that requires that the, only the five grapes that can be utilized within this wine are Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. Um, we actually grow Malbec here in Virginia. We have a small planting here in New Kent. Um, we don't actually have it in this wine, but we hope to have it within our within our Meritage within the next two years. And that will make it actually a full Meritage in the sense of the Meritage Alliance. I really do appreciate um, everyone signing in, signing on, and actually learning about our wines. Please, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A, especially about the wines. I'll be here until the end, and I can answer any of those questions that you guys may have. If you would love to come see us, if you're close by, please come and visit us at the winery. We'd love to let you try. We make 11 other wines as well. So please come by and try those. We also have a microbrewery on site as well. So I appreciate everyone's um, persistence and actually signing on and really looking forward to seeing what everyone has to say about the wine. So thank you so much. And I'll pass it back over to Bracey. Thank you, Jake. And Tim, we actually have a question in regards to the workflow for the healthcare uh, for the, the pharmacy uh, benefits manager. Um, was everything that you showed within the decision studio? And if so, um, can you show a set of screens outside? Are you able to iframe forms? Um, are you able to put these forms and dashboards on separate apps and websites so users can interact with them, say, without having to log in? Absolutely. And that's a great question. We, we do that all the time. It's actually kind of the bread and butter of our product. So any of the forms, the reports, the dashboards, Everything you've seen today, I, I have done within the Decision Studio for purposes of demonstration. However, they can all be brought outside of the platform, so users don't even know they're in the platform. As an example, if we wanted to show this dashboard, just, just, for, just for the sake of argument here, I can actually come in here, and with a quick change of the URL, I can actually turn off all of our branding and styling, and you can simply... You can simply uh, embed this within your own site and users wouldn't even necessarily know they're in our product. The same goes for the forms. If you have a workflow with a set of forms in it, um, this is something I've actually done myself. Um, it, I, was, I was actually a customer of Decisions before I joined the team. And this was something I did before I joined. Um, I had a, a student portal and the students would log into it and would access forms and workflow in Decisions, not even knowing they touched the product. They thought they were in ours. They interacted with it that way. And, and it works very, very well and, and can work to pe just depending on how, uh, you know, what you need and, and what your particular uh, use case is. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Okay. So uh, the next part of our, uh, of our journey tonight, um, we've had a red wine, so now we're going to look at rules. Um, this one, uh, I will say, does not have all the fancy forms and things that the last one did. This was more focused on, on rules and, and how they operate within the system, what it looks like, and, and how we get data in and out. And, and to the point I just made, this is all centered around decisions being in the middle of other systems. So this process was set up. The idea behind this is we have, we're working for a company that interfaces with hospitals. We work between hospitals and between insurance companies. And when the hospitals submit their billing packets for review, we need to run that information, that HL7 data, 
through a list of rules to verify and ensure that the data is set up correctly. So, you know, there, there are things that can automatically kick these things back. Things like, you know, if the guarantor, if the, or excuse me, if the uh, patient is less than 18, then we have to have a guarantor on file. You know, if, if the uh, accident is a worker's comp type, there are certain fields that have to be filled out. And a lot of that, just based on human error, can happen throughout the process. There's a lot of data that has to be captured, and, and every now and then things can slip through the cracks. So the idea is how can we take, and using rules within our platform, how can we take that data in and ingest it and run those sets of, of comparisons and, and data cleansing utilities on it and spit out either everything's good to go and this is ready to submit or this could be uh, then sent back with what are the errors, where did it break and what do I need to look at to ensure that this makes it through the next time. So with that context, um, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, again, what we're starting with here is if we look at our clients, we have two clients within the system here. We have, and, and these are amazing names because I'm absolutely the most creative person on the planet. Um, but by the way, if I have a little bit more of that wine, the names might get better. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Um, but our, our clients' names are our good hospital and our better hospital. Um, and that has nothing to do with how good they are as far as patient care, um, which is names that we came up with. Um, but in each of these two hospitals, these two clients we have, they have a set of rules. And in this case, these two hospitals have the same set of rules, but they are uh, uh, separate. So each hospital has its own set. So we could come in here and see, you know, good hospital has these five rules assigned to it. And each one of these is doing a different calculation, a different comparison, and a different data cleansing utility. So if I was to start with my first one here, these are typical statement rules. But if you've used our product or if you've seen our demos before, these are much more complex than what we usually show on a demo. However, in the healthcare field, everybody knows that data, those rules are very complex. So we wanted to give a real world sense of, of what you can do in the platform. So these are typical if then else statement rules. However, in the case of this, we're doing some very complex things. I have this given input, so I'm passing in some data for this particular uh, healthcare organization, this HL7 data I'm passing in, and I'm saying either the, the patient's date of birth is, you know, they're, either they're over eight or under 18, and all of these next kins, these NK1 fields are filled out. So if they're under 18, we have to have all of those NK field, NK1 fields filled out, or they're over 18. So either one of those two things can, can satisfy this rule and allow this particular piece of data to pass through. So this packet is, is valid. Now down below, our rule is not just outputting true or false. Now we are outputting true or false, but we're also outputting error messages. So we're able to take and abstract how this, uh, how this works. And we're able to abstract messaging and, and data in such a way that I can say, when this rule runs, this is the error message I want it, want to be displayed. So it's giving prescriptive guidance back to the user in a dynamic fashion. If we were to look at another rule, for example, here, guarantor is a minor, for example, we can actually go in here and look and see, well, we only have one rule, but we have a different error message that's, that's being uh, passed out. So again, for each run of the rule, I'm going through, I'm grabbing the information, I'm keeping a list of these errors, and I'm building that list that I'm gonna then return to that, to that other system, to that end user. So to do that, what we've done here is if I pop down into my workflows here, we have this run rule set flow. And what this is doing is, uh, again, self-documenting features of the system here, we can come in and look and we can see we have our start step. So because I'm using this as a system sitting in between others, what I've done is I've told the workflow engine, expect data to come in. So when I run this, when I call this workflow, I'm saying, I'm going to give you, you should expect HL7 data, and I'm going to pass in a client ID. That is how I was able to dynamically tell it what rules to run. So I said, you know what? We have our, our base set of rules. I know that I have a couple clients. When they send in their data, send me your client ID, and that way I can pass it off to the correct set of rules. So once I get that client ID, I do a lookup and see which client are they, which folder of rules do I need to pull, and then I simply pull those rules and run them. 
We have two steps here, two little workflows I created that actually process those rules. So it grabs that list, it runs through with all that data. And then if there were any errors, it creates a list of those errors. And then that's what's passed back out. So in the workflow we just looked at, the starting and the ending point were forms. In this case, we've done away with the forms and we've told it to run this as an API. And to do that with all of our workflows and all of the rules within our system to, to the point I was making earlier, you don't have to run it from here. And in this case, it wouldn't make sense to. So if you notice up here, we have a way to publish. So, you know, I can, I can run our debugger. I go through the visual debugger, which, which uh, some of you may have seen before. I could right click and run this and give it some data. It would work. But if I tell it how I want to publish it, I'm going to publish it as an API. I'm going to give it a name that makes sense to me, health rules. And I'm going to say view. And what this is going to do is decisions in real time is going to build that API for me. It's going to build that endpoint. I can tell it how I'm going to authenticate. And what it'll do down here is it's going to give me what is that URL I want to use? What is that endpoint I need to give to the other system? But the biggest thing that sets us apart is we do all of the work that development would usually do for you. We give you a representation of exactly what we expect in. And I apologize for how long this is, but if you know HL7, you know it's just a beast of a data type, <laughs> 20 pages later. Um, but we also give you a, a representation of what we're going to pass back. We take all the guesswork out of creating these integrations. With a click of a button, you know exactly what you have to give us for it to work and exactly what you should expect in return when it completes. So if I take that information, I take that rule and take that, that URL and information over to, to my other system, and I'm using that in quotes, <laughs> we're going to use a, a testing utility called Postman. This is a, a third-party free application out on the internet you can use to test APIs. I have some set up right here, ready to go. And I have, if I click on this one, we'll see I have that URL from that other system, you know, health rules here. And if I look at the body, I have my client ID, good hospital. I have my payload, you know, my, my JSON, my, uh, my HL7 packet right here, ready to go. If I simply click send, that's going to call decisions in real time. It's going to run that rule set against that data dynamically based on that client ID and return. Well, that's not, it doesn't work. You know, in this case, what it's saying is that patient's under 18 and apparently there's some data missing in that NK1 field. So now at least I know, okay, I mean, I know exactly what the issue is, but I know where it is. I know what I need to do to solve it. And we've done that all dynamically. You know, if I were to take and change this client for instance, to something that doesn't exist, we'll see that this doesn't actually work. We're able to kick it right out and say, well, that's an invalid client ID. So we don't even process anything. We just stop it right then. We catch them right as soon as it runs. And, you know, we don't have to worry about running things and taking up processing time for things that aren't going to work anyhow. And you might say, well, that's great. That's good. And what, what do I do when I onboard my new client? I mean, that was a lot of work. Well, what we're able to do is, again, you know, we're a workflow company. We're an automation company. That also means we can automate things internally. So not only can I automate your business logic and your, you know, your, your flows and your applications, we can even automate automation. <laughs> I think I just coined that. Um, but we could even take, and, and we wrote another rule set or another workflow here. And what this does when I run it, it's going to show me a form. Now, again, this is all internal. This is something that people inside the, the company would use. You give it a client name, Happy Hospital, for example. You say, I want to use the rule template. And what this is going to do, I've got a folder down here full of rules. It's going to go down there, look at it, see what's in there, and show me the rules that are in that folder. And I can and verify that that's what I want my new client to start with. When I hit create, it's going to create a new folder over here. Here, you'll see it pop in. It's going to make a copy of all those rules. And now my happy hospital is ready to go. If I needed to make a change in here, I could say, you know what, maybe I don't need this rule anymore. Well, I could get rid of it. If I needed to change the logic in one of these others, I could. Um, but I've done 90% of the heavy lifting in three seconds. I mean, this is a process that could have taken you know, a week to get done if, if you were doing it by hand. But because we can set our, our system up to run in a dynamic fashion, I can automate a lot of this using the tools that we have that we were using to do automation. If I come over to my Postman now, I have a couple uh, other packets set up here for our happy hospital. And I can take a look here. And if we look in our, our body of our message, we can see that that's the client ID. And if I send that over, we can see 
everything worked. It returned to green. I was able to go from something extremely complex, onboard my new client in a, a mere matter of seconds, and run it immediately. You saw, I don't, I don't even have to change that URL. It's the same. So that way, you know, I've, I've made it very simple. I've abstracted the, the difficult part, you know, using the forms and workflow to do that stuff for me. And, and I'm able to move on very, very quickly and, very, and be very agile in the market when it comes to working with this types of data. So that being said, I am going to turn this back over to Gracie and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I will take a look here. So Tim, we have a question from Rupesh. Are you able to transform standard HL7 message to JSON format, or do you expect to receive HL7 in JSON? Uh, so HL7 is a great topic. Tim, can you tackle that for us? I can, I can. And, and actually, I also just noticed that my background is backwards too, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, so, so we actually have a full HL7 module within the system. We don't have to use it in JSON. This was just a requirement that came to us um, and, and, and in, a, in another, uh, another, uh, another idea that we had. Um, but no, we actually, we can use the typical ADT messages, those typical pipe delimited uh, um, uh, HL7 messages. We can work with them. We have a full module that knows what they are, how to deal with them. And we can use that natively instead of having to use JSON at all. So we just, in our case, to make it easier to show, we can actually go in and um, we can actually go in and, and make a JSON because it was just easier in a dem demonstration format to actually show that off to you. But no, great question. We absolutely can transform standard messaging and we can do it via flat files, via you know, TCP IP, if you have that set up within your uh, particular EMR, um, all of that's available within the platform. Thank you, Tim. Would you mind showing the module that you can install um, for HL7, if you can pull it up just quick? Just one second here. I don't know that I have it installed in here, but give me two seconds. Yeah, so within the platform, if we come into our, our features here, we're going to get a list of the different modules we have within our system. And if we come down here, we'll see HL7 is actually one of those modules. So if I was able, if I took a look at it here and told it to install, it'll take it just a second. It's going to add that to my system. And what that's doing is with this module, it's giving me a ton of different steps within the toolbox. And all of those steps do things like, you know, uh, uh, receive an envelope you know, parse a message, you know, is it, is it, what type of message is it? Is it ADT? Is it another type? And then within that message, it pulls all of that data out in a way that you can actually work with it in the system. So as, as far as, you know, when you were looking at the, the different rules I had set up that had JSON associated with it and it had the NK1 and it had the PID and it had all of those uh, different elements within it, our module lets you work with that data without doing the transformation. It, it does it all in the background as part of the actual HL7 module. And I apologize, but my, uh, it's taking a little bit, I'm, I'm using this on my local laptop. So <laughs> it's taking it a minute to install the, the module, but, uh, but that is the, you know, that is how we can interact with it. Thanks. And we also have a fire module as well. I'm um, just a little bit to the left of where that HL7 module uh, fire is a particular kind of HL7, uh, which we also support, um, which especially for being able to write rules against the HL7 and fire standards is something that a lot of our healthcare clients have taken advantage of. Um, I'll give us just another second for any questions, of course, Rupesh, you're very welcome um, to see if we get anything else coming across the line here. Well, it looks like uh, no. So I want to thank um, Jake again from New Kent Winery. The wines are absolutely delicious. I was just commenting to my uh, colleagues that I normally don't like red wine. Um, and a lot of people are surprised, like, because... I, this, I just, I don't this like This is it. my new jam. But yes. I this, love this. This red wine is <laughs> extremely smooth. It's delicious. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we love working with local Virginian companies. Um, so we'll probably do this again soon. Um, and thanks to everyone, to all of our attendees. We hope you all enjoyed the wine. Uh, please feel free to contact us. Thanks everybody for your time this evening. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.